Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Courtney Shaler Smith. I manage the Adirondack Rural Health Network for Adirondack Health Institute. We're proud to welcome you to today's webinar, Managing Patient Client Resistance. Our presenter today is Melinda Huffman. She is from the National Society of Health Coaches. Melinda is a cardiovascular clinical nurse specialist, certified health coach, author, writer, and nationally known speaker. She is a co-founder of the National Society of Health Coaches and conducts coach clinics nationwide in evidence-based health coaching, patient engagement, and motivational interviewing. Melinda has a BSN from the University of Alabama, Bing Bing I'm sorry, from the University of Alabama, and a Master's in Nursing from the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. Melinda, thanks so much for joining us today. We're going to wait about one more minute, and then we're going to turn it over to Melinda. We still have some people joining the webinar. Melinda? Yes. Hi. Are you, do you want to wait a minute or two, or would you like to start now? Whatever you would like, I'm fine with. Uh, you just tell me when well, to start. Well, why don't you get started? We've got a number of people on the line, and I know they're eager to hear what you have to say, so let's go ahead and begin. Okay, that's fine. Thank you so much. I really have appreciated the invitation to be with you all today. Managing patient and client resistance, that is something that as healthcare providers, we, uh, we tend to struggle with um, to a great degree. And if you weren't able to attend the previous webinar that we uh, conducted a about health coaching and motivational interviewing, I encourage you to watch that whenever you can or to listen to it as it will help you better understand and apply the material that we'll discuss today and also the practice that we plan to engage um, in today with you. Our overview, next slide please. The overview of what we'll be discussing today is the writing reflex defined. Next slide please. Why the writing reflex occurs what causes the resistance as a rule, how to manage and roll with resistance, and some practice. When we get to the practice portion, you'll be asked to enter your responses in the question box online at the right of your screen. This will help um, all of us to learn from everyone's responses. Because as you know, in health coaching and motivational interviewing, what's wonderful about MI in particular is that there's no real absolute black and white. There are better responses than others, but there are many responses that work in various situations. And so we have found that having people to enter their responses and engage in this type of practice is really helpful uh, to everyone. So we do ask that you please participate at that time to maximize this opportunity. Next slide, please. So at first, let's just do a real short uh, brief over um, recap of MI that affects the way that we should respond to resistance. First of all, when we really think about MI, it's that collaborative, skillful style of conversation. And in that, we've got to elicit and strengthen our patient's own personal motivation for change. Next slide. The spirit is also very uh, critical. It's how I am with people. Think about that, how I am with people. I want you to think about tone tone of your voice. What I say and what I help them to say really does make a difference in whether behavior change happens. So we've got three goals in mind when we are conversing, and that's how I am with someone, what I say, and what I help them to say. The next slide, please. So just what is the writing reflex? The writing reflex, it's a natural tendency for one to resist persuasion. That is just absolute science. We're going to see to resist anyone who's trying to persuade us. If we perceive persuasion, next slide please, and so why does this actually occur? Why does this writing reflex occur? When a decision isn't easy, we generally feel at least two ways about it to begin with, and this is uh, an internal argument that we're actually having with ourselves. Well, I would exercise, but I just don't have the time. I would try to stay on this diet, but I like sweets too much. I would try to manage my diabetes better, but I just hate going through all the things that I've got to do. I just get so weary of it. So it's the butt in the middle that creates a lot of that internal argument. We would do this except for that. So when we enter the picture, first of all, understand that our patients already have an internal argument 
related to their health and their health behavior most of the time. And when we try to correct or wrong someone, meaning we want them to take this particular path instead of another path that they may be going on, then they're naturally going to take up the other side of the argument that is already going on from within. In other words, resistance to the provider. Next slide. But what is so key here is for us as a provider to try and really seek to establish a 50-50 partnership. And what that means is that we've got to look at that patient differently. Whether it's our client, whether it's our patient, we must look at them as our partner. And I want you to think of a 50-50 partnership in health being this. You bring 50 cents and I bring 50% to the table and the patient brings to the other 50%. The patient is the expert in their own lives. We have been trained to be the experts in the knowledge and the information that we provide. And that knowledge that that patient can tap into is wonderful. But the information about that patient that we can tap into is going to be the key to helping guide them to achieve better outcomes, to reach optimal recovery, uh, to engage in better health and, and, and wellness, uh, and even prevention, to lower their risk, and so forth. So it's all for the betterment of health. But if we begin to take on the attitude that when we reach out and guide patients and clients in any kind of relationship, that we've got to achieve that 50-50 partnership. That is our goal. Because within that, many, many different things begin to occur not only to help us reach our goals, but more importantly, help that patient and family reach their goal. And we've got to be able to do that in order to tap into their own motivation to want to be part of our relationship. Next slide, please. There's two sources of resistance that we like to focus on. Um, and while there may be many, there's actual, actually two types that if we can remember these types, then it will help us not be a, uh, a resistance creator and will also help us deal with resistance from within. So we've got two sources. It's just from the, the client and the patient um, themselves. And it's also sometimes that created by us. And I call that angels unaware because most of the time, providers are completely unaware of the resistance that they may actually be creating in the patient and the client that they're helping. Next slide, please. So let's look at resistance and that that's created from within the patient and client. We've got to believe, we have to know that a patient's values and their concerns, their beliefs, morals, their faith, their birth generation, all of that affects their decisions about what they're going to do related to their health whether they'll even allow us as providers to guide them there in the driver's seat. Now, that is something that's sometimes difficult for us to, in our skill level, actually work toward. I mean, we, we, we try to believe that if they just have the information and the knowledge, that they'll move on that. But that is just simply not the case. We know there's a whole lot more to tapping into their own motivation than simply the knowledge. When we recognize that that patient is the true change agent, then that allows us to be more comfortable with a new approach and a very different understanding of how we might go about engaging that patient. Next slide, please. First of all, we tend to believe what we hear ourselves say, and this is also science, that the more that patient talks about the reasons for change, the more likely he is to change. And if we continually talk in a way that's going to cause them to defend where they are, remember that internal argument that we mentioned, then change is less likely to occur. They are less likely to want to walk alongside us. On the converse of that, the more that they talk about the disadvantages of change, the more that they're going to be committed to sustaining the status quo, and they'll actually resist. So it's up to us to carefully and knowledgeably guide that relationship as a 50-50 partnership and guide that conversation to really promote the patient's thoughts about changing 
toward a positive behavior. And we cannot do that through advising and telling and insisting. No matter what the right reason in our mind is, we know that that can result in a rotting reflex, which will create resistance. Next slide, please. And it's worthy to reiterate here, even though we did so in that first webinar, of why people don't change behavior. And this is important because as you look through these reasons, there is something that you won't find that was listed there among a survey of thousands of people in why they don't change behavior. And this also relates to health specifically. Their values don't support it. They don't think the change is important. They don't think they can make the change for whatever their reason. They haven't worked through their ambivalence or their conflict, their inner conflict about it. I would do this, but I have this going on. They aren't ready. They don't have a good plan, or they don't have adequate social support, and that also can include finance. But look at all of those various reasons. It's more about their own internal issues that are creating some of that, I don't think I can do this. And we've also added another one. This has not been surveyed, but we've seen this in our practice over and over and over, that they will have some kind of underlying fear. For instance, if you're helping someone to quit smoking, uh, and maybe it's a female, because we know females have issues with gaining weight more than men in that particular uh, behavior change. They may not quit because they're afraid of, of, of gaining weight. So it's a, an underlying fear that sometimes can create some of that inaction. Next slide, please. I want to thank Brenda Stiles, who is a uh, director of care management for the University of Vermont Health Network. And also I want to thank Jessica Frazier, who's the director of care management at Hudson Headwaters Health Network, for sharing some of the reasons that you all hear on a day-to-day -day basis, or that they all hear, um, where we can actually work with some of these types of comments that patients make as we move into some of our practice area just a little bit later. Some of those reasons that you all are apparently hearing, it's not uncommon. Across the country, we hear these very same reasons. I'm too busy. I'm fine. I just don't need it. I don't have anyone to watch my kids. I don't feel well. I think I'm doing just fine. I have pain, and I just can't sit there and wait to be seen. It's too cold, and I, I, I can't breathe in this weather, so I've, I'm staying in. I'll come when it's warmer. Reservation cigarettes are 100% natural. In other words, it's a no, not me. And we know through our stages of change that many of you may be familiar with, or at least if you're not familiar with the stages of change, we know that the very first stage of change is it's pre-contemplation. In other words, I'm not even thinking about it at this moment. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it's not ever. So there's some things that we can do to help solidify the relationship. But this is typical resistance. Um, they're either not ready or they're not ready at that moment. And please keep that in mind. It doesn't mean that they're never going to be ready. Next slide, please. Unfortunately, I think sometimes Next slide, please. Sometimes I think, unfortunately, that we have a feeling of this. If it's important to you, you'll find a way. If not, you'll find an excuse. And when we think of our patients in this way, then we begin to lose sight of that 50-50 partnership. But we, we step back and, you know, we, and unfortunately, sometimes we label that as an excuse or noncompliance. But if we can begin to see this as an opportunity to respond, in a different way that will keep that patient or, or the relationship, the patient relationship alive, then we will have more to gain in the end. And that patient will have more to gain in the end. Because remember, without that relationship and a 50 50 partnership, we don't really have the patient. We may be checking the box that we've done certain things with that patient, but we don't really have that patient. So let's look at this slide, stages of change, the pre-contemplation, no desire. Because this is where a lot of patients will reside when they're in that resistive kind of phase. They're basically thinking I'm, or saying, I'm not ready. No, thank you. I'm not interested. But more importantly, not now. It doesn't necessarily mean not forever. But there are things that we can do that are very important 
for us to be able to do and skills that we can implement that will help either build that relationship, solidify that relationship even further, build trust in that relationship, or even restore trust in a relationship that where the trust may have been lost. And that's important to know as well. So don't let anger or frustration take hold, and don't dismiss the patient as never being ready. But there are things that we can do. We can empower them so that they know that we have empowered them, that they know that we understand that they truly are in control, because honestly, they are. And no amount of telling and preaching and insisting or shaming or arguing is really going to change that at that moment. Develop and maintain that rapport. And again, that goes back to the tone of our voice. We were in an advanced uh, level motivational interviewing discussion the other day, and we talked about how important tone is. Even when you say and use the very same skill, that the tone can change the entire skill to a different level or a different meaning. So tone is important. Don't be discouraged, number one. And number two, don't burn those bridges. Because remember, it can simply just be temporary. Next slide, please. So in developing rapport, there are two things that are critical. Em empowering the patient, asking permission. Would you consider? Would you be interested in? Do you have any objection in or to? May I give you some reading material about? And in giving them information, another way to is empower them is to do the elicit, provide, elicit. Many of you may know this through your motivational interviewing, but it bears um, a reiteration here. Respect what they already know. Anytime you can show someone respect, that helps to build trust. And we have to converse in a way that lets that patient know that we understand that he's the boss because he truly is. Next slide, please. Developing rapport, using empathy and open-ended questions. And sometimes we throw around empathy as if, okay, so I'm supposed to feel as if they feel. But we have discovered a way that really brings this home to the healthcare provider. <clears throat> Next slide, please. And we have to remember that in truth, we are them. Now, when we're talking about your populations with disparities, is it difficult for us to know exactly how they feel? In many cases, it will be because our situations are different. But there is one situation that I want you to please remember that will help you have empathy toward any of your populations, but especially the population with disparities. When we say we are them, I want you to remember this. I do want to share a tip that will help you show empathy more than anything else that you may have come across. You've probably done much reading on the research, but it's true, and the percentages are still this. 40 to 60% of patients, any patient population, will not follow treatment plans, will not fill prescriptions, and let me say this, it's not only patient populations, but it's populations of healthcare providers. It doesn't matter where we are in the country. Large presentations, small audiences, large audiences. 50 to 60% of this population that we teach, <laughs> providers like ourselves, will hold up their hand when we ask this question. How many of you have not at some point in time filled a prescription, followed a treatment plan, or have filled a prescription and never taken it as directed. Hands, at least 60% of the hands go up. So if you can simply remember that, yeah, when it comes to health behavior change, many of us, including myself, and I put myself at the top of the list, we may have had high cholesterol. We may need to lose weight. We may need to stop smoking. And we have those same issues personally that will keep us from moving forward. While not exactly the same issue, we have that internal argument, and that's the issue I'm referring to. It's an internal argument based on something in our lives 
that causes that resistance. And if we do not lessen that resistance through the way that we engage and what we say and how we say it, then the resistance will continue to be there all the more. So I encourage you to remember that little tip that we are then in that one particular way and probably in more ways than one. Next slide. And then open-ended questions. That is key for us as we can tell when someone is resisting us to use really sharp and smart open-ended questions to redirect that conversation. Of course, we know that it requires thought on the part of the patient for them to respond. But it also helps us to redirect when we do feel and sense that resistance. And I want to say this, that is one way when you can self-evaluate your motivational interviewing skills, and many of you already have some of those skills, that's a good self-evaluation tip. And that is when you sense resistance, oftentimes it may be something that we have said the way that we have said it that has created that writing reflex. So just keep that in mind. Not always, but it's not uncommon. Next slide. Those opening the questions are going to allow that patient to reflect upon their own concerns and values and hesitation. The reason that is so important is remember, it's that 50-50 partnership and help that we're trying to establish. So while we're the experts in the knowledge, they are the experts about their own concerns and values that will either help or hinder their moving along with us, alongside us. And to guide them successfully, we've got to be able to tap into that motivation that's going to help bring them along with us and us with them. Next slide, please. Open-ended questions sound very much like the describe, tell, where, explain, when, why. But I also want to give you this little heads up about that. Sometimes we have people who, when they see that first word, what, they think that, that, might, that that's an open-ended question. That's not necessarily the case. It's what follows that makes it that true open-ended question that helps, to, helps that patient think about changing or think about what may motivate them. We're trying to get to the bottom of what will motivate them to move. Next slide, please. The examples of this, how does blank help you the most? What would happen if you decided to? And remember, when we say it in that way, we're still putting the, um, uh, the decision making within that patient's uh, hands. If you could, what would you need to change for you to be able to? And you'll notice, if you could, we're not saying you must, we're not saying you have to, we not, we're not saying do this, we're saying if you could or if you decided to, what would you need to change in order for you to be able to move in that direction? That's what really helps them to get to, to start thinking and, and to, to get moving in that direction, even with their mind. Describe how you would feel if you could. Please give your thoughts about why do you believe this is happening and when is it the best time for you too. And of course, there's many, many more. I'll be happy to send you that if you would like for me to. You can just let Courtney know and we'll make that available to you. So we've talked a little bit about resistance from within. Let's talk now about resistance that's created by the healthcare provider. Next slide, please. And again, we call this angels unaware because many times we're not aware that this is actually occurring based on how we're saying what we're saying. Next slide, please. We have just simply got to avoid creating that resistance. And these are responses that the science has found that usually result in the writing reflex and result in resistance from the individual that we're working with. We've got to try to resist the urge to. And let me say that because we try to write individuals, we try to correct them. We don't want them to have a stroke if their blood pressure is not managed. We don't want them to have high blood pressure if their weight is not reduced. And, and it just goes on and on. So we, in our own way, without realizing it, most of the time, we're, we're, we're creating some of this resistance ourselves. 
when we try to convince someone they have a problem, when we try to argue for the benefits of change, when we try to tell someone how to change. And it's, it's kind of funny, in all of our coach clinics that we conduct nationwide, as we're going through hours and hours of practice, it's not uncommon for healthcare providers, and that's who we, um, that's who we engage with, is as we're practicing, they'll be telling the individual they're working with, they'll be the health coach, and the other provider is, is playing the role of the client and the patient. It's very common for, for the health coach in that role to tell them, well, have you thought about exercising when you get off of work? Have you thought about maybe trying to lose only just two or three pounds a month? Have you thought about using the patches or the gum? What about if you consider, it, it just goes on endlessly and we have to stop them right there and say, think about what you're doing. Remember, they are the 50, other 50% 50 of this relationship. They are the ones that need to come up with their own reasons for change because we do know that those reasons that any of us come, uh, come up with for changing, that motivating factor that creates some of the change want to, as I call it, that's coming from within. Just think about it. We could offer suggestions all day long, and that patient may just be, or the client sitting there looking at us saying, they don't even know me. None of those things work. And think about it. You could spend 30 minutes or all day doing that, all to no avail. We're very task driven. We don't have time to go into all those things that may not even apply, that they may not even be interested in. So the easiest thing that I think for us to begin to focus on is telling someone how. We've got to resist that urge. Now, if someone is newly diagnosed, there may be information that they need, but remember, we also know that in health coaching with motivational interviewing, we've got to elicit, provide, and elicit. We've got to empower them to give them that information. And all of that, there's a purpose behind why we approach it in that way. Also, we need to resist the urge to warn them of consequences. Now, we know that with physicians, they have a responsibility to give the risks, the benefits, the downside, and consequences. So there is an exception there because within their practices, that's a responsibility that they have. And it may be for some other prescribers as we move forward in some of the healthcare reform that we're experiencing. Next slide. So what does provider-created resistance sound like? Next slide, please. Let's stay with convince, argue, tell how, and warn. And let's uh, look at some of what this may sound like. Convincing. Reservation, reservation cigarettes say 100% natural, but they're really not. Arguing. You want to breathe, don't you? It's really interesting. I'm, I'm sure you look at that and say, how, how, Melinda, that sounds ridiculous. How can that be? My father was in a skilled rehabilitation uh, facility, and it was getting ready for discharge. My mother, who is 88 years old, was sitting there. I was sitting there as we were listening to the nurse give us information about preparation for discharge. And as she began to reel off all the things in a, this is what you have to do. Now, you have to understand that we had not been engaged with the care team, even though we had asked, until discharge, because we were told, oh, they'll tell you everything you need to know. Now, I want you to think about that. They will tell you everything you need to know. Given that kind of setting, the RN comes in to discharge us, and when she said, okay, he'll go home on oxygen because he had experienced a bout of pneumonia um, as a comorbidity while in an exacerbation while in uh, the, uh, the facility. And my mother said, oh, I don't want that. Now, you have to remember, if they had engaged her much sooner as a 50-50 partner, they would have understood where that concern was coming from. The nurse turned around. I don't want that oxygen tank in my house, my mother said. And the nurse said, well, you want him to breathe, don't you? I thought to myself, oh, my goodness gracious. <laughs> Arguing for the benefit. End result, my father did not go home on oxygen. My mother resisted. I was okay with that because I was really in control. I could auscultate his lungs. 
I could get the respiratory therapy there, which we ended up doing anyway by the time I got home. But I wasn't going to create any more issue for my mother. I turned around. We talked about that. But these kinds of things happen all the time, people. I want to try and have you just think about what you're saying and especially what you hear others saying because we can learn from them as well, telling how. If you don't feel well, well, this is reason enough for you to come in. Warning. You've got high cholesterol. You've got to get that down. And even when we're sincere and even when we mean well, this is what resistance, provider-created resistance can sound like. And these are just a few of those examples. So I want just over the next 15 seconds, think of some of the things that you may have even said yesterday just to think back, could that have created any resistance? And just kind of self-evaluate. Next slide, please. While you're thinking of that, I want to take this approach just for this one example and have you use the question box or the chat area to type in your answer. I think it would be great for people to see as many of you respond as possible. I want you to write a response that creates resistance, a response that you think, based on what we've discussed thus far, would create resistance. When a patient says to you, I'm too busy taking care of the kids, whether you've tried to have them engage in a phone call, they don't have time, or whether you've asked them to come in, keep an appointment, and the response they make is, I'm too busy taking care of the kids. As many of you as uh, you possibly can, if you're in a small group, if one or two of you would like to enter in the chat box, please, I encourage you to do that at this time. Those are wonderful, wonderful examples coming in. Well, maybe you, <laughs> this is great. Well, they need you alive, don't they? Could you find someone to watch the kids? If you don't come in, you won't be able to take care of the kids. I can't tell you how many times I've heard that one. You'll figure out if this is a priority. And this goes right back to what we were talking about earlier. What about exercising after the kids go to bed? Wonderful. I'm sure you can find someone to watch them for a little while. Excellent, excellent example. Excellent example. If you don't take care of this, this will happen. You really need to do this or you may not be around for your kids. Some of the very ones that you all have mentioned are perfect. I don't have a ride. How are you going to take care of your kids if you don't take care of yourself? Let's go with the next slide, please. Thank you all so much for participating because those are excellent, excellent ways of creating resistance that we want to avoid at all costs. Okay, next slide, please. Bring them with you. I love that one. Well, if you don't meet with me once a month, we'll have us could you bring your kids with you when you exercise? Again, offering all kinds of options for them. Okay, next slide, please. Thank you again so much. That was wonderful. Now we're going to switch gears. We're going to go from having written one item that may create resistance, the very resistance we're trying to avoid, to trying to take some of the things that we've talked about, and we're going to practice writing some responses that would help us manage our role with the resistance that we may feel. Next slide, please. Your patient says, I'm just too busy. Think about ways of writing an open-ended response that would help decrease that resistance. and give some thought to it.
and start to enter those into the chat area and everyone be watching all of the responses that are coming in. Tell me more about that. Explain your schedule to me. And remember, tone. Just keep that in the back of your mind as well. And as you're thinking of and, and writing in your responses, think about also in using that response, what type of tone might also lessen any resistance that they may read just in the statement that you've made. Do you have days that are less busy than others? What kinds of things are keeping you busy? Excellent. As um, those of you who are still thinking, we've got some other ones that we do want to practice on, but I want to suggest this. Next slide, please. Here's some responses as well for this particular uh, patient who says, I'm too busy. What, is, what seems to be hindering you the most from XYZ? I love this next one because it puts that patient in the driver's seat as they are listening to you. If you could. What would you need to change for you to be able to come in? Said with a tone that is sincere, non-arguing, non-shaming, and see if you begin to get some response that may be a little different than the response that you might be getting today. Let's try another one. Next slide, please. I'm fine. I don't need it. If you will, take a moment to enter responses again. I'm fine. I don't need it. And I've put the words that you see in this example in red because those are the things to really focus on. The patient says they're fine and they don't need. How can we help elevate some of the things or, or excuse me, do you, it's going so fast, I'm having a hard time keeping up. Do you know we're open for extended hours? When would be a better time for you to talk when you're not busy? That was from earlier. If you could free up some time, how would that, I think that was from the last one. I'm fine, I don't need it. Don't need what? What would happen if you decided to? Can you tell me a little bit more about what you mean by not needing it? If you continue on this path, this could happen. I hmm, want you to think about that one. Is that warning them of a consequence? It could be. That's fine. We can move on to, and again, tone will be very critical. If you weren't fine, what would that look like? Interesting. Tell me what you would like to focus on. Can you explain how you feel fine and why don't you think you need it anymore? Okay, let's go to the next slide, Dylan, if we may. Here's just a couple of additional ones. Next slide. What do you believe has helped you the most? Now, whether we believe that we may think that they are not well based on other data that we have or other interaction with patients that we've had, but remember, Remember, as a true change agent, we're working off of what they say, and we want them to articulate, if it's true, that they've been, that they're better, 
or that they've been helped the most, we want them to articulate that because in doing that, in doing so, in talking, in their talking about that, they may actually come to the conclusion that, well, you know, well, maybe I'm really not fine, as fine as I would like. And then you've got another opening. What positive results have you seen from? And this is going off of the fact that the patient says they're fine. Well, what positive results have you seen? What do you believe has helped you the most? Or what did you see in yourself that you liked the most about being better? Because that gets them to tell you. And that begins to have them to really think about it. Next slide, please. Let's look at this one. Reservation cigarettes are 100% natural. How would you respond in this way that will not create resistance? Your responses are really good. Hemlock is natural. I'd like for more of you to weigh in on this one because I understand that this one is, is uh, one that you're also struggling with other information that's out there about these specific, uh, you know, specific cigarettes being natural, 100% natural. What makes them natural? I never knew that. Can you tell me what is natural in them? What do you think natural means? What do you understand natural to mean? Wow, they must be expensive. <laughs> Can you help me understand what makes them 100% natural? Tell me more about the research you've done. Tell me more about that. Excellent, excellent. Next slide, please. Sounds like you've done some research on cigarettes. Here's a, another couple of responses. May I give you some new information on this, which would be information that you I understand that you have about this 100% natural business. And we all, all know that, too, this 100% natural um, uh, label on some of even our – in the grocery store is not what we think that they are, uh, they are. How do you believe these cigarettes are different for you? A question that's asked in this way also gets that individual to explain what they understand and what makes it different for them. That could really get down to then some really good discussion about what's in those cigarettes. Very interesting. That's an interesting issue that you all um, have that you're dealing with. Very good responses. What part of the cigarette is natural? Excellent. Let's go to the next slide. We've got a, a couple of more of these. The patient says, I'm sick. Can you call back some other time? In red, sick, can you call back? How do you respond? Or if you have been thinking about, maybe I've been responding, maybe not in the best way, what might you recommend based on some of the things we've discussed today? You all are doing a wonderful job. This is great. I'm sick. Can you call back some other time? When will be a good time to try again? Can I plan to call you at a certain time? I'm sorry to hear that. When would be a better time to call? What's a good time for you? These are all excellent because honestly, and let's go to the next slide, Dylan. How can I help you feel better? I love that one. Next slide. You're not well. What can we do to help? I'm sorry you're not well. How can I be of help? What is the best time for you this week? So it is. It, there's going to be plenty of times when that individual truly may be sick and does want you to call back or just simply cannot deal with 
um, a conversation at that time. And so the best thing for us to do is to simply reflect the fact that they are not well, ask what we can do to help, extend your, uh, I'm sorry that you're not well, and how can I be of help? What's going on? How are you feeling? Do you need to come to urgent care? Of course, can you tell me what's wrong and the best time? Those are all excellent responses because sometimes they're just not ready. Next slide, please. This one um, is, is rather interesting. I'd like for you also to go in and, uh, and enter this chat box with some good open-ended questions to respond to this patient who says, look, I know what to do with my diabetes. Can you please tell me what you do for your diabetes? Tell me about that. Can you tell me what you do to manage your diabetes? Could you give me some examples of what you're doing? Can you explain to me how you manage your diabetes? explain. That's great. How do you manage your diabetes? I want to offer um, a suggestion. Some of these questions are asked in a way of a closed-ended question. Can you? Um, if you would consider just leaving that can off and making the statement, please tell me what you're doing about your diabetes. I'd like to hear more about what you're doing to be successful. Tell me how about your diabetes. Just convert those closed-ended questions to an open-ended, tell me what you've been doing that works. That's a good one. Anyone else? These are excellent. I encourage you to begin to convert those closed-ended questions to open-ended because a yes-no, I think you will get more of their responses if you will cause them to think more about how they are actively and successfully, if they truly are, managing their diabetes. This is an ideal situation. What would be happening to take care of your di or in an ideal situation, what would be happening to take care of your diabetes? Next slide, please. And we're earing, nearing the end of our uh, examples here. Here's some thoughts. We don't hear this very often. What have you found to be most helpful to you day to day? You know how to manage your diabetes and things are going well. Of course, that's a reflection. And then if no reply, what help would you like from me at this time? They may still need some help in, in an area, but it also will have them think about, do I really manage this 100% perfectly? And they're the only ones that can really express what it is that they still struggle with, even though we may have our own ideas about it. They've got to bring that to the table. We're here for you when you need us when may I check back with you? And that's basically um, saying to them, you said that you know what to do, so we're here for you when you need us. And if you've got that relationship developed with that patient, then you're gonna know when to move into this type of response, we're here for you when you need us. Because you may that may make you feel a little uncomfortable and that you're letting go, when in fact you're really not, not letting go all the time, depending on the patient's situation. You may not feel comfortable in, in doing that. So it all it all depends upon that patient situation and what you know about that. Let's do one more. I know I need to check my sugar, but it's hard and I just don't have the time for all that. And 
everyone please uh, look at the responses as they're coming in. I know I need to check my sugar, but it's hard. I just don't have time for all that. There's several things you can work off of in this comment. First of all, the important thing is I know I need to. That's huge. But there's a but there. It's hard for her, and they don't have time for all that. So, what difficulty have you experienced when checking your sugar? Please tell me what's hard about checking. How can we help you with making this less hard for you? These are wonderful. You're hitting the nail on the head with these. Are there more? Are you comfortable with that? Can you, can you elaborate on that particular question? Are you comfortable with that? Let's talk about how you feel about diabetes. Excellent. What makes it hard for you? What's been the hardest to manage? What do you find difficult about checking your sugar? Maybe you could set a reminder to help you. What time of day do you check your sugars? How can I make time? How can you make time for that? Okay, let's uh, have the next slide, please, and let's look at some uh, options, other options to consider. Some have already been mentioned. You all are doing a wonderful job. It's important to you, but it's hard. What makes it difficult for you? When they say, I know I need to, then it truly is. They're telling us they're important. It's important to them. And we can simply reiterate that we understand that. We hear them saying that it's important. And we also hear them saying that it's hard. And many of you said, what makes it difficult for you? And again, it's tone. If I say it's important to you and it's hard, but it's hard for you, what does make it so difficult for you? That tone is very different than, well, what makes it difficult for you? So you understand tone is, is everything. It's important to you, but you don't have the time. If you could, what would you do first to fit it into your routine? What's most important to you about checking your sugar? What would be the benefits for you if you could check your sugar regularly? Hopefully those are some additional ones that you can add to your repertoire um, that may uh, make a difference as well. Um, I want to ask now, uh, you can go to the next slide, Dylan, if you have any questions or any comments at all about what we've discussed today, especially in terms of the resistance. It's always helpful. I, I found it always helpful when I'm dealing with patients who are showing resistance. First of all, do a self-check on my, my own self-evaluation. What did I say? How did I say it? What tone did I use? Especially when I get aggravated with a patient. <laughs> you know, I think that they need to be doing something that they're not. That's, that's something we all have to resist uh, because it's certainly only going to, uh, you know, create that. So create that resistance. So it's, it's important to, to always remember, first of all, we've got to keep that 50-50 partnership and help alive. And to do that, we've got to be, what we've got to watch our tone. We've got to resist the urge to tell, to direct, to shame, to blame, to argue, um, that, that isn't going to get us anywhere, um, at least not the direction that we want, want to go in continuing to keep that relationship alive. And in some time, we have to accept the fact that they're not ready at that moment. And we've talked about some things that, uh, that we can do to continue to develop that rapport and continue to empower them. Because honestly, as the true change agent, they're the ones that will decide whether to come in at all, whether to re-engage with you, and we want them to engage with us whenever they do decide to engage. Key, key point there. Um, for, for any kind of training and education uh, or health coach certification, please consider our program. Here's our information. Uh, we have group discounts. 
Gaspar Adirondack Health Institute partners that we'll be happy to talk to you about if you have an interest. This is just the tip of the iceberg. We know that many of you have had motivational interviewing. Some of you may be new to health coaching with motivational interviewing. And there's so much um, practice that, that we can engage in uh, that's really helpful, especially on a periodic basis. Um, any questions at all? If not, Courtney, I'll turn it back over uh, to you to close out our session together. Melinda, thank you so much. That was a wonderful webinar. I'm very encouraged by the amount of back and forth participation we had. I wanted to say thank you to Brenda Stiles and Jessica Frazier, who agreed to be interviewed in the creation of this webinar so they could speak to our regional challenges. I wanted to remind everyone that we do have, we will have this webinar archived on the Adirondack Rural Health Network website at the end of next week, and the first webinar that Melinda already did is already there. Um, we will have the slides as well. There's a lot of questions coming in about can we see the slides. I'll get it up there by the end of next week at the latest, I promise. If anyone has any questions, you can feel free to reach out to me or Melinda. And I'm not sure, do we have anything else? Any other questions come in? Okay, we have a few questions. Hold on. Well, there's a question here, Melinda. When I have someone I get connected to services, it leads to they don't have a ride and they don't want to bother someone. How do I offer assistance and come up when they come up with more reasons for excuses? Um, it's very. I mean, that's a very um, a very interesting uh, situation because if they don't have a ride, then that means that that the the facility or the entity has to really talk about that with with uh, the people who, I mean, can you offer rides? Are there taxi services? Or I know here in our area, uh, for those who cannot afford it, we have county transportation that is run by uh, the federal government uh, that may not cost anything or may cost 50 cents. Most of the time it's whatever they can afford. So. Honestly, I would want to know what resources I have access to that I can draw upon because that's a real issue. Now, if you think they're making an excuse, then that's, uh, that's another issue altogether uh, because basically some of the ways that we responded today, that's the, that's the only thing that, that you can do. Um, we can't pretend that we know the truth because we, we don't. We can think they're making an excuse. And only over time, through a pattern, can we guess that this is again an excuse? You know, are they just crying wolf, and it's another you know excuse to get us you know off of their back? And that is a very difficult one. But have you have you looked at you know the resources that you have, and, and those resources don't exist? Um, someone just what came forth and said that New York Connects is a really good resource for rides. And another question came up uh, said. We have Medicaid transportation, but it's hard getting them there as we're referring them to public transportation, but a lot of them will not, are not within the bus line and are able to utilize that. So these are really specific questions that are coming forth. That's very interesting. Melinda, do you want yeah. to speak to that a little more? Or? Yeah, that, that really is a, is a question that would, it's going to have to be directed to the, you know, the, the administrative piece of this. We have had some of that as well. And, and first of all, it's going to be important to really address, address those types of responses to know exactly what your resources are. And then if they're unable to access that resource and you're not able to pick them up, then okay, what other ways can I connect to literally just make a connection? Uh, you know, we've had some people, uh, in with uh, populations with disparities have cell phones and to talk to people over that cell phone then you can really begin to drill down if they're not even willing to talk over the phone <laughs> then you know you've got the problem that it, that it truly isn't the transportation now if they have to come in for some type of intervention uh, diagnostic work or blood work or whatnot then that's a different issue uh, and those are not easy uh, to deal with but you have to know, first off, right out of the gate, what kind of resources to have a physical uh, relationship, response, uh, visit. You know, do we can we uh, 
uh, acquire. You know, what can we do with our resources? And everybody that, that uh, everyone that is interacting with these patients need to be well averse in what resources do exist. And as an administrator, even as a practice or a policy, if they cannot get here, if they say they don't have transportation, and we have no way of knowing if they do or not, all we know is what our community provides and whether they're going to access that or not, then what is our next step? Is it going to be phone contact through their cell phone? Um, is it going to be telephonic from that point forward? And, and, and decide what's going to be our practice about how we engage these patients. I think that's almost a higher level question that's more of an administrative, this is the first thing we've got to do, and then we use our open-ended questions uh, and resist uh, to, you know, resist the urge to create resistance, if you will, um, just like we have here. Does that make sense? Yeah, Melinda, that was a wonderful response. I really appreciate everything you said today. We're getting lots of great comments. We just got to thank you. I learned so much. I appreciate this webinar. Oh, that's so uh, nice. Really thank you. You all have been wonderful to participate, and I really have appreciated that. It helps so much when uh, people participate. We learn more from each other, uh, honestly, than, than we do from any one presenter. So I want to thank you all for, for being so wonderful to work with. It's made it easy for me. Well, thank you everyone for signing on today, and this webinar will be archived on the Adirondack Rural Health Network website, or you can go to the AHI website, ahihealth.org. We'll have that up by the end of the week, and if anyone would like to reach me, you can reach me at csmith at ahihealth.org. Again, it's csmith at ahihealth.org. We're going to put that in the chat box so you can see it. And uh, thank you all for joining us today. Have a wonderful afternoon.